Good morning. We're going to get started. Uh, welcome to the uh, gene editing for liver and respiratory diseases. Uh, just a quick reminder, please silence your cell phones. Um, and uh, our first speaker is Ed Morrissey from the University of Pennsylvania. He's going to uh, give a talk titled The New Insights into Lung Development. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, great. Well, thanks to the organizers for inviting me here today. And I guess my charge is to sort of give you a bit of background of lung development of biology and also sort of show you where we're going uh, into the near future and hopefully even longer beyond that. Um, this is a schematic, a sort of a diagram that sort of outlines basic lung developmental biology that was written or driven, drawn, I should say, by a very talented graduate student, Rachel Kadzik, several years ago. And I think it highlights some of the, the major concepts that we'll be discussing a little bit today. But I won't go into too much detail about the earliest stages, which are driven primarily by specification, utilizing uh, molecules in the anterior forega, such as Wnt and BMP and FGFs, signaling to the anterior forega endoderm and saying for this little strip of endoderm right here, this is contiguous both with the thyroid, more anterior, stomach, and other things more posterior. This little region right here that's going to turn on NKX 2.1, that critical transcription factor that many of us know about uh, in, in lung uh, epithelial cells, is going to turn that transcription factor on, specify the anterior or the uh, lung primordium, and soon after that you're going to go through a process of branching morphogenesis, again driven by this iterative epithelial mesenchymal interactions uh, that will drive this, this, this highly arborized structure here that eventually at birth we all use to breathe. So again, like I said, I'm not going to go into a lot of the very basics here. I think it's, it's well-trodden ground, some real giants in developmental biology, Bridget Hogan and others have outlined this process very beautifully over the last couple of decades. Um, what we're going to focus primarily on today is the sort of later stages of lung development. Alveologenesis, that maturation stage is absolutely required to get us to the point where we can actually f effectively uh, uh, transmit uh, oxygen and, and CO2 across the gas exchange interface in the lung. And this requires uh, the real fine maturation of both the airways. Um, here you have a pseudostratified epithelium in the upper airways of the mammalian lung underlied by basal cells, which are the resident progenitor cell. These cells can generate both secretory as well as multiciliated cells that line the respiratory tract. Um, obviously a lot of disease etiologies begin here, such as CF and other things. Asthma obviously affects this component of, of the respiratory system. Um, interestingly, less is known about the alveolar components and compartment in the lung. This is really where gas exchange takes place. This is a highly unstructured environment here. There isn't that sort of nice, classic, arborized, genetically hardwired conduit of airways. Down here in the parenchyma of the lung, where the vasculature comes into close opposition with the, with the epithelium and with the uh, luminal side um, of the exterior that's exposed to the environment, this, this region here isn't got that classic sort of uh, architectural stereotypical uh, um, uh, morphology. It does include several very important epithelial mesenchymal and vascular cell types that we're going to discuss today. And really one of the major drivers in our research in the last couple of years and I think in the next few years is going to be to understand all the different cell types here, understand how they develop, how they mature, and also then how those cells are regenerated after severe injury such as it takes place in influenza. So this is just sort of an outline of some of the major questions in the lab. We really sort of view the respiratory system as a co-developmental system with the, with the cardiovascular system. I mean, that's really the role of the respiratory system here, is to exchange gases with the blood. Um, so it's intimately tied, it's intimately uh, co-developmental process of these two organ systems here. So one of the biggest questions is just simply how do the lung and the heart co-develop? How do they arise at the same time during development and they sort of interact and synergize to each other? Um, to form this uh, very, very functional respiratory system at, at birth. What is the source of the pulmonary vasculature? Obviously, this is a key question. Uh, a lot of diseases affect the pulmonary vasculature uniquely. This is not like the systemic vasculature. It responds physiologically as well as the cellular level in a very different way than systemic vasculature. So where does this vasculature, vasculature come from? And finally, how does the gas, available gas exchange niche form? And again, reform and regenerate itself after severe injury such as it happens and influence and other models. So to go back to the beginning, as they always say, is, 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 is important to understand where and whence the lung came from. Um, several years ago, uh, Ashley Goss, a graduate student in the lab, 
had been doing some studies looking at the role of wind signaling in early lung development where she knocked out the critical and essential wind defector beta-catenin using an early deleter sonic hedgehog cree. This comes in, on in the anterior foregut endoderm prior to specification of the lung, so she can inactivate the wind pathway, a very important pathway in development, prior to the lung even arising in the anterior foregut. And what she found essentially was there was no lung at all. You essentially, you don't get a nice separation of the trachea and the esophagus as you see here at day 10.5 in a cross section through the anterior portion of the mouse embryo, you get a single tube. There's no presence of a trachea, there's no presence of NKX 2.1, which is a critical transcriptional regulator that drives early lung development. What was interesting about this model, not only did we get lung agenesis in the model, but this allowed us then to ask, well, where do the pulmonary vessels come from, right? The pulmonary vessel is very distinct, very unique, very different than systemic vasculature. So we were able to look, take this model and say, literally, where are the pulmonary vessels? Are they there at all? Maybe they're not there. Maybe there's something about the lung that needs to be there to, to have the pulmonary vessels form. Interestingly, over here, and it doesn't show up terribly well, but this is a PCAM CD31 whole mount of both control and these beta catenin and mutant embryos. And essentially, what you can see here, the alpha attract of the heart here, you can see the pulmonary artery still coming down here in the mutants and trying to find the lung bud, which is like this little region right here. So the pulmonary arteries come in, the pulmonary veins try to come into where the lung is, even though there's no lung. So there's some pre-programmed genetic program there that says you need to go and find the lung even if the lung isn't present. So some of that must be coming from sort of early cardiovascular progenitor uh, pathways. And through a series of, of, of studies that I won't go into in detail today, they, they're actually been published several years ago, we identified a particular molecule, WINT2. This is a ligand and a WINT signaling pathway. And it's expressed right here in the anterior pole of the heart. You can see it in situ hybridization here by whole mountain and by a slide in situ that it's expressed in the mesoderm surrounding this anterior foregut region right here. And this is right where NKX 2.1 is going to turn on. So really you can tell it looks like it's the right place, right time to be signaling in a paracon fashion to say you are going to be lung. And, in, and this molecule then we utilize by knocking in a tamoxin inducible Cree, this molecule we utilize to trace these mesodermal cells here that are not only critical for generating this WIN2 ligand, but also seem to be in the right place and the right time to potentially help co-integrate the developing lung and the heart. And if you look at these cells in green here, you look at them 24 hours after tracing them, and they're right here. Here's the anterior foregut, and this is where the heart is in the atrium. So they're sitting in this little place here, right in between the heart and the lung. And two days later after the tag, these are being tagged at 8.5 and now looking at 10.5, these cells start to flow in and start surrounding the early lung bud. And if you take that lineage trace out even further, so you tag these cells at 8.5 and you take them all the way out to 17.5, these cells, these WIN2 positive cells, will populate pretty much all the mesodermal components in the lung, as well as the inflow tract of the heart. They'll populate and make atrial myocardium, epicardium, endocardium. So they really help knit together the cardiovascular system and the developing lung. Uh, we went on, just because that was a single lineage trace model, we went on to do the same experiments with GLEE1, which is a sonic hedgehog effector, which also is in the mesoderm, also flanking in the same region around the anterior foregut, similar to where WINT2 was, as well as islet one And I should say islet one is a key and critical marker of early cardiovascular progenitors. And this lineage trace also showed that they would mark all the mesodermal components in the lung. So basically, we were able to define this real region right here, which we call CPPs for cardiopulmonary progenitors, that resides right between the heart and the developing lung. They're there at 8.5, even before the lung is specified, and they're engaged and sort of flow into the heart and the lung simultaneously to sort of knit together the developmental process between the two organ systems. And this is just sort of a lineage tree that uh, we, we developed from this. These cardiopulmonary progenitors are positive for WIN2, GLEE1, ILET1. They make a very early decision, I should say, that uh, they turn on NKX 2.5 or not. If they turn on NKX 2.5, they'll generate uh, uh, cardiovascular progenitors. In other words, cardiomyocytes, uh, atrial myocardium, pulmonary vein myocardium, as well as the epicardium and endocardium in the heart. If they don't turn on NKX 2.5, they generate more of this cardiopulmonary mesenchymal progenitor, which generates pretty much all of the different mesenchymal lineages, except one, one big exception, and that's the fine capillary plexus located in the alveolus. Those cells do not, are not generated from the CPPs at all. They are generated from the essentially flank endoderm that's already there in the embryo, day 8.5, 9.5, that flows in through an angiogenic process and helps populate that distal portion of the lung. This is just a diagram of the process that we're talking about here. So uh, 8.5 to 9.5, the CPPs are here in, in sort of a beige pink color, lying between the early cardiac uh, uh, organ as well as anterior foregut. And this is just around the time of lung specification, and that's sort of noted here by this little nub in the anterior foregut. 
and they go on to populate the inflow tract of the heart, generate the pulmonary vessels and pulmonary veins, uh, which all goes on obviously to integrate and sort of knit, uh, stitch together the two organ systems. So now we're going to move to, to the alveolar region of the lung and try to understand this a little bit better. Um, so like, as I said before, this is a highly unstructured portion of the lung, yet this is where the gas exchange component of the lung occurs. Uh, some of the cellular components, just to remind people, they're aligned by two basic types of epithelial cells. These cuboidal cells here are the uh, alveolar type 2 cells. They express the surfactant to reduce surface tension, allow you to breathe, your lung to collapse and expand every time you breathe. And the alveolar type 1 cell, which is really the very thin squamated cell that overlies the vasculature, develops and forms that very thin gas diffusible interface and allows us uh, to breathe and, and to uh, exchange gas, CO2, and oxygen. Also, I'm going to mention a little bit later, there's a whole host of different mesenchymal cells around here that are poorly characterized. In addition to that, there are immune cells flying around, alveolar macrophages and stuff like that, again, that are, that are somewhat poorly characterized. So this is a highly, you know, uh, obviously important portion of the lung, but we know very little about it outside of the, the different cell types I just told you about. So again, going back to some of the concepts in early developmental biology that are starting to educate us about late development as well as lung repair and regeneration. Um, one of the pathways I've already mentioned that is key and critical is wind signaling. And wind signaling essentially works in a, in a fairly straightforward fashion where most of the important ligands are in the surrounding mesoderm, such as WINT2 and 2B, and they are instructing the underlying epithelium or endoderm to turn on certain genes and become proximal distal, uh, distally patterned in the lung. WINT is generally considered to be very uh, important for distal development, the distal branching tips of the lung bud. Um, where the alveoli are going to rise from, and less important for the more proximal conducting airways of the lung. So because of its importance and because of there's key critical downstream effector molecules that can sort of read out where wind signaling activity occurs, we decided to develop a better tool to understand where and when wind signaling was occurring. And I don't have a diagram, I just realized that when I was going through the talk this morning, of this new tool, but essentially there's a molecule called Axon2, and it is a downstream Effector of wind signaling, it is probably the best and most well characterized target of wind signaling. So where Axon2 is expressed is sort of a, is a surrogate for wind signaling activity um, in a given cell. So we generated a, a reporter, mouse reporter line where we knocked in a tamoxifen inducible Cree, a 2A stop, uh, uh, a self-cleaving peptide, I'm sorry, and then a TD tomato fluorescent reporter. So we can do two things with this. And I think that's illustrated um, in the next couple of slides. One, we can lineage trace those cells. If we hit them with tamoxifen at a certain time point, we can lineage trace and tag those cells for their entire lifetime at a certain time point and say these are actually positive for wind signaling activity. And also, at any given time, using cell sorting or uh, immunohistochemistry, we can stain for the tomato fluorescent protein and say, yes, that cell at that given time is also positive for wind signaling. So here's a, an example of the lineage tracing uh, using this mouse model where we've tagged the cells using Cree recombinase to either 10.5 or 15.5. At 10.5 and looking out at 14.5, there's a lot of green cells here. So the green cells are all the cells that were positive for Wnt activity in the early lung at 10.5. Now we're looking at 14.5. The red staining, I should say, is NKX 2.1. But what I think you can see is there's a lot more green cells in the branching epithelium here in the distal region than there is in the more proximal airways here at 14.5. Uh, at so even at 10.5, there's a higher level of wind signaling activity in the distal uh, branching point of the lung. Um, if you tag them at 18.5 later and then look at 16.5, that's 24 hours later, again, really what you're seeing here are just these green cells in the epithelial uh, compartment really just appearing in the more distal regions, not in the SOX2 positive proximal regions. And again, over here, in some of them, some of these green cells also are positive for the very distal progenitor marker SOX9, as you can see here. So really it seems like it's primarily confined to that distal region, which we sort of already knew from uh, previous studies. So we go a little bit later now, and we follow this Wnt reporter out to 18.5 and P4. By 18.5, I can tell you that almost all of that, all of that Wnt activity is almost completely shut off. It's just sort of very few scattered salt and pepper throughout the lung. Um, some of them, some of the Wnt positive cells or SCGB1A1 secretory cells, very few ciliated cells, few type 2 cells, few type 1 cells, but sort of scattered, not a real pattern. What was remarkable, though, when, you know, if you look at this at 18.5, the pathway is pretty much shut off and it's not, doesn't really have a, a defined pattern yet. But if you look at P4 just a few days later, all of a sudden the pathway gets reactivated again in a subset of type 2 cells. And I think that's illustrated here very nicely on how well it shows up, but I've 
outlined the type 2 cells, which are staining in green with surfactant protein C, and initially at 18.5, they're pretty much, they're not red, and they start becoming red as you move on through development by P4 and by P30. So there's a subset of these cells that wind signaling activity uh, reoccurs in. And that coincides, again, with increased levels of actin-2 expression in the type 2 cell population between 18.5 and P4. So when we look at this and do careful quantification, and, and I've got some really great postdocs and grad students who are willing to sit there and count thousands of cells, because sometimes that's what you just have to do. Um, but essentially by P4, 97% of, of all of the Wnt positive cells are a sub subset of type 2 cells. There's very few other cells that are positive in the lung epithelium. There's a few secretory cells located next to neuroendocrine bodies, which other people have proposed to be a progenitor cell type for the airways. And those do appear, some of those do appear to be positive for wind signaling activity. But the vast majority, greater than 97%, are really just a subtype uh, of type 2 cells. And really what this is, is telling us, and I can't go into too much detail because of time, the paper actually uh, was published last year in Cell Reports, is that there's, even though the pathway, the wind pathway gets dialed down and pretty much turned off by bursts, it gets super activated again in this very distinct subpopulation of type 2 cells, which we sort of call a wave of react wind reactivation in the type 2 cell population after birth. And we believe, uh, and through studies that are in that, that uh, recently published paper, show that this helps drive alveologenesis. This is really critical for that sort of last burst of growth in the alveoli in the lung after birth during the alveolar genesis period uh, that goes up to P30 in mice. So that's just sort of uh, schematized here. So we believe wind signaling is critically important. It'll take some portion of these normal uh, AT2 cell progenitor cells and turn on axon 2, and those cells can be uh, identified through axon 2 expression within this type 2 population. And it also plays an important role by promoting type 2 cell self-renewal during alveologenesis, and it has a key role also in restricting the differentiation of these type 2 cells into type 1 cells. So that's a paradigm some of you may be aware of, that type 2 cells are a progenitor cell in the alveolus, and they presumably make type 1 cells. And we're going to talk about that for the last few minutes here because that paradigm may not be as clear-cut as we previously thought. <clears throat> Before we start talking about that question, though, I sort of wanted to show you a little bit of new data. This is data under review right now where we've extended this model, these, these axon 2 positive uh, sublineage within the type 2 lineage. What is happening to these cells in the adult lung? They do exist. They are there. They comprise about 20 percent of the overall surfactant protein C positive type 2 cell population. And we're looking at this both at homeostasis as well as injury. And the injury model we've decided to use is, was, is um, uh, flu injury. This is the H1N1 PR8 strain, um, which many of you are aware of causes, depending on how you titer it, can cause very severe damage to the lung. We've actually titered it back a little bit so that it doesn't completely blow out the lung. And one thing that's really critically important, I think, that this slide illustrates nicely is that lung damage caused by flu is very spatially different, heterogeneous. Um, there are regions uh, that are basically unaffected, sort of an A here in the, in the green box. The regions of mild effect here in B, where you get sort of mesenchymal thickening, and you can see some inflammatory infiltration. And then you have these two zones here, which C and D. D is this very, very damaged region that basically is occupied, after, after the injury, is occupied by these keratin-5 uh, P63 positive cells that sort of what I feel is a little bit like scar tissue. It's basically, it's something the lung is trying to do to con, you know, contain the barrier function of the lung without the whole organ blowing up and falling apart. And then there's this sort of border zone around, around it, uh, zone C, which we find to be very interesting. I'll show you some data that this is where we think a lot of the regenerative capacity or, or activity is occurring in the lung as it's trying to repair itself. The D zone, as, as Hal Chapman and, and Jason Rock have now gone on to show, some, most of these, or a lot of these regions, I should say, never really resolve. They stay these sort of keratin-5 patches of scar tissue in the lung. And this has been observed in human lungs, too, after intense uh, influenza injury. So it's probably that these <coughs> resemble some sort of scar tissue, and this, these cells may never actually completely repair. So what happens to these axon 2 positive cells in the context of a flu injury? Well, at first, like I said, there's about 20% 20, 20 of the cells of the SPC positive cells are axon 2 positive. That proportion increases. You can see here there's a green cell lineage traced with the axon 2 rep uh, uh, reporter system that's also SPC positive, using, looking at uh, that nice white staining that sort of gives that punctate type 2 cell staining. Um, these cells increase in the regions of more severe injury. And I should say right here, I didn't put a dotted line, but right up here is that sort of dead zone, this blue area here that doesn't contain any, any white, red, 
or a green stain is that sort of keratin, pi, keratin 5 positive dead zone of, of keratinized epithelium. But it's around this region, this border zone here, where a lot of the regenerative capacity is. And what was amazing when we looked at this from a proliferative standpoint is these axon 2 positive cells are the only type 2 cell that actually is proliferating. So the non-axon 2 positive cells really don't respond to proliferates. Just this component, this axon 2 positive sublineage within that type 2 population that actually is proliferating. And we have termed these alveolar epithelial progenitors because these seem to be the ones that are really driving uh, 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 regeneration. So we've gone on to do a lot of studies. Like I said, this, this paper actually is out under review. Hopefully it'll be impressed soon. Um, we've looked at these AEPs compared to the rest of the AT2 population. They have a very different genome and transcriptome. Um, at, at a, uh, at a uh, ATAC-seq open chromatin standpoint, they have a very distinct region, uh, subsets of cells that are poised. The chromatin is open. The genes have not yet changed their expression, but we now know through other studies that the genes, will, those genes that are poised come on after influence injury. So these cells appear to be poised for reentering the cell cycle and responding to certain uh, transcriptional pathways. So, you know, that sort of gives them a sense of like they're ready to respond, they're ready to go, um, but they're just sitting there waiting for a stimulus such as injury to, to do something. Um, and again, they do make some type 1 cells. This is coming back to the concept that type 2s make type 1 cells. They do do that, um, not efficiently. So here, I think this is the, this shows you most clearly, is you can see a lot of new type 2 cells here in the square, the square portion of this uh, graph, but only like, you know, 5 to 7 or 8 percent of these cells will actually turn into type 1 cells. So that process is fairly inefficient in these AEPs, and we've actually seen that as well even with just the type 2 cell population in general. Now, I should say one of the caveats of this is we've only looked 30 days after injury, so I just may not be giving the long time enough for these type 2s to turn into type 1s, but still. The, the sense from us is that the type 2 cell doesn't really want to turn into a type 1 cell, at least very readily, in the flu influenza model. So we went back and we've looked at this a little more carefully now, and during alveologenesis, when the cells are a little more plastic even, um, when we're looking at the type 2 uh, AT2 population, even when we turn on beta-catenin and or turn off beta-catenin, we, we just don't see a lot of type 2 cells turning into type 1 cells, only a couple percent. So that started raising questions in our minds, like this paradigm of, type 2 being the progenitor, generating type 1 cells during development, also generating type 1 cells in the adult. Maybe it's, it does do this. I'm not saying it does not. But the low percentage was just raising questions in our minds because if you think about it, an alveolus has to have roughly the same number of type 1 and type 2 cells if you're going to regenerate it. Um, so we're not seeing the number of type 1 cells that we would expect. And this sort of goes in line with uh, some recent studies uh, from the Krasnow lab suggesting that there's a bipotent progenitor cell roughly around 18, 18.3 of development. And, and his lab suggested that this cell had, you know, if you say bipotent, I'm assuming he's, he, he means it has equal ability to generate type 1s and type 2s and was a major driver of alveologenesis during development. Um, it was a very intriguing and very uh, in interesting finding. So we just sort of wanted to say, well, is that true? And if that's true, is it, is it a real 50, 50, 60, 40, 70, 30, what is this? So we went back in development and using two different Cree lines now that we can tag type 1s or type 2s specifically. And type 2s, this is the case with type 2s, surfactant protein C, Cree ERT from Hal Chapman's lab. We have tagged those induced those with tamoxifen day 15 or day 17. And we're looking at the end of alveologenesis, P30. So we're taking them all the way out to the end, presumed end of lung development. And what was remarkable to us is that if you're a type 2 cell, you know, at E15, this is pretty early in development. This is before alveologenesis, before saccolation even. Um, so sort of at the end of branching morphogenesis. That 95, 96% are already committed to the type 2 cell lineage at that point. And if you look at E17.5, it's like 98, close to 99%. And we can just, by lineage tracing, we can simply just by just counting cells and facts analysis of cells, it really, really is quite a profound result when you see that. That says to us that lineage commitment of the type 2 cell population is very early, at least by 15.5 and maybe even earlier. Did the converse experiment. There's a very good type 1 cell marker called HOPX. This is a mouse line generated by John Epstein at, at Penn. Um, it's, very, it's a very early marker comes on very early in develop lung development, comes on like around day 13.5, at least the, by in situ hybridization. But we can, can't get the Cree line to work earlier than 15. But at 15, which is the earliest time we can get it, we can still see that if you're tagging these presumptive type 1 cells, that 85% of those, if tagged to a 15, 15.5, 15 
by P30 are type 1 cells. And again, that get, goes to uh, about 90 to 95% at 17.5. So it seems like type 1 and type 2 cell commitment specification has already occurred very early in development. If these cells had passed through a bipotent state at 18.5, you would see far greater contribution on either side of the type 1, type 2 barrier by any, either one of these lineage drivers. So this suggests to us that type 1, type 2 cell coma is occurring very early on, and I think that has pretty important ramifications if you just look at the classic Waddington curve about how stem progenitor cells relate to the differentiated progeny. If you have an early progenitor way up here at the top of the hill, and it generates type 1 and type 2 cells, you can imagine the distance between these cells, transcriptional epigenetic distance, is pretty great. I mean, it's already made its decision at 15, probably early. We have data now that suggests it's making the decision as early as 13.5. But that decision, type 1 versus type 2, is quite far. You know, it, it, there's a distance between those two lineages. Versus if you have a progenitor that's lower down on that hill, where the distance could be much shorter here, and it might be much easier to convert between a type 1 and a type 2. So we feel that actually what's happening is that these cells, type 1 and type 2 cells, are much, much more different than we've ever appreciated. If we, and I'm not going to show you because of time, but you can actually look at day 15 and day 16, where they're positioned in the stalk, the distal stip stalk there, not even mixed in together, dis distinctly, completely different spatial positions within the branching airway of the lung. So we think they're different, we think they're specified much earlier in development, and we think that has extremely important consequences because it probably is a roadblock, probably is a, some sort of barrier that inhibits and slows down lung regeneration. It also might suggest that we have no data for, I'll be honest with you, that there is another population of cells out there that is capable of making type 1 cells, either during development or in the adult lung. But I don't, that's total conjecture at this point. So the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to go back to this mesenchymal population in the lung that, that we've been looking at more carefully in the last year or two. And as I said, there's lots of different cell types here, PGFR alpha positive cells, myofibroblasts, lipofibroblasts, what are these? I don't think anybody really knows that has a good handle on um, so we've sort of called these like different flavors of lung mesenchyme. So what we've done, oops, did I do something wrong? Go back, here we go. Um, so what we've done is just go in and start looking at the different markers that we know do mark subsets <laughs> of lung mesenchyme based on our studies and others. One of those is PHFR alpha. Uh, there's Wnt2 positive cells uh, that we use their Wnt2 CREAR-T driver. There's axon 2, which marks a subset of uh, uh, mesenchyme in the lung. Um, and there's double positive, Win 2 uh, PDGFR alpha double positive, axon 2 PDGFR alpha double positive cells, as well as single positive cells. So this is just a little bit of a schematic diagram. Where we find these cells at baseline is by immunostaining, is we find a lot of axon 2 single positive cells surrounding the airways, around the blood vessels. Pretty much all of the axon, or the PGFR alpha and PGFR alpha uh, double positive axon 2 or Win 2 positive cells are out here in the wrong income of the lung in the alveolar region. So we really wanted to see what are these cells, and, and they weren't really, on the, you know, the same cell. There, these are definitely distinct populations by immunostaining. So we wanted to go through and just sort of analyze these cells more carefully. So we did sort of these out uh, just essentially using basic facts analysis. We had Cree drivers for all of these. Did population seek on all of these? You can see here by PCA analysis, they're very distinct and different by population seek. And we did some classic just sort of mesenchymal marker gene expression analysis showing, again, these are all very distinct populations. They actually exhibit very distinct transcriptional profiles. Didn't put it on here. We've recently got back single cell analysis. And if you use single cell analysis and tell the computer, can you cluster these five populations by single cell? Indeed, you can cluster these five populations. So they are very distinct uh, uh, lineages as far as we can tell. So how do you get at their functional relevance? So we've been using the organoid model system where we can sort out these different populations. We primarily focused on the, the four, the fifth one, the other, the flow through. We haven't really focused on because we can't tell it does much. Um, but what we have found is that this axon to PDGFR alpha double positive cell really makes these lung alveolosphere organoids. So these are organoids generated from type 2 cells in the adult lung. Really, these axon 2 positive PDGFR alpha positive cells really makes these lung organoids grow really well, and that's quantitated over here. So this seems to be some sort of like an alveolar niche-like cell that is important for type 2 cell growth and renewal. If we look at these, uh, these cells, which we naturally have called mesenchymal alveolar niche cells, we do RNA-seq on those, and we compare that to the RNA-seq data from type 2 cells, and we essentially just come up with a, a, a paracrine interacting signaling molecule um, paradigm here and say which ligands are expressed by either Manx and other population AMPs 
and which could be received by type 2 cells. We come up with some very, you know, classic pathways that are probably driving type 2 cell self renewal. STAT3, BMP, FGF, and others. So we know that these MANC cells are generating ligands like such, such as FGF7 and IL6 that are talking to type 2 cells and say so you need to proliferate and you need to differentiate. Um, and this is playing an important role. Now we have data also after, after injury or after influenza injury, yes, that shows these pathways are critical for repair of the, of the lung. So this is the last slide, and it just sort of illustrates what this last part and sort of integrates some of the earlier stuff that we've been talking about. So we've identified a alveolar epithelial progenitor cell here, this axon 2 positive, a subset of type 2 cells. And obviously type 2 cells slit in sit in close opposition to different mesenchymal cells here, either axon 2 yellow cells, PHFR alpha green cells, or cells that are both. Um, the cells that are both axon 2 and PHFR alpha double positive are the closest, I should say. We've actually mapped this out distance-wise. They sit the closest to a type 2 cell. And we think these cells play an important role in, in driving and maintaining the alveolar niche, whereas these AMP cells, we call alveolar myelogenic uh, precursor cells, are the ones that we have done lineage tracing on to show that they generate the bulk of myofibroblasts after injury. The one thing that we haven't done yet is talk about the vasculature, and hopefully at some point in the future I'll, I'll be able to uh, discuss that in more detail. I have a great lab here outlined uh, all the people involved, um, and I'll stop there and take questions. Hi, that was a lovely talk. Um, uh, have you used any other models of lung injury apart from flu? And would you, if you had, would you get the same kind of uh, cell types? So, so we've done bleomycin, bleomycin, which is, you know, admittedly not a great model. Um, mostly to understand that sort of myofibrogenic progenitor. That's what we've used to sort of turn it into a, a fibroblast. Now, when we do that, we do see it, as far as type 2s turning into type 1s, we do see more type 2s turning into type 1s using the bleomycin model. So there may be something about this that is very injury dependent, because that's what Bridget Hogan used when she got 30, 40 percent of twos turning into ones was the BLEO model. So it could be something very, very injury dependent upon this. We didn't see 30 to 40, we saw more like about 15, 20 percent, but it's still definitely more than the flu model. Different. Thank you. Nice talk, Ed. Um, what do you think, from, from the standpoint of defining you know, what that special alveolar type 2 cell is, that 20 percent that's axon 2, you mm -hmm. know, positive environment? Is it I intrinsic to that cell? And, and if you were able to ablate that cell specifically, do you think other alveolar type 2 cells would fill it in, adapt, and then become? Yeah. Good question. So, so the question is, what makes this cell special? Where did it come from? And is it e essentially essential for right. the regenerative process? So we believe that cell is born during alveologenesis. It's where you see these type 2 cells acquiring the axon 2 positivity. We've, we've traced those cells from alveologenesis through adult. Those are those AEPs in the adults. So we think the cells are born during that period. We know if you trace out to at least nine months, cells are very stable. Type 2 cells do not acquire this fate during that nine-month period. It's a very stable state. Um, even after injury, we don't see non-axon uh, 2 positive cells acquiring an axon 2 signal. So it seems like these cells are programmed during alveologenesis. Um, they, there's no apparent data that we have in hand yet that other non axon 2 type 2 cells can acquire that fate. Um, but we haven't gone beyond nine months to really push the system. But I think it's a pretty stable state as far as we can tell at this point. And whether we can ablate them or not, we, have a, um, we do have a different cell surface molecule now that we can grab these cells from the human lung. Uh, so we can do a very simple experiment in the human lung organoid system is if we take all type 2 cells and we remove that 20, 25 percent of the axon 2 positive cells using the cell surface molecule, they will not make organoids. Mm -hmm. So that's the closest we've come to an ablation model. And if we can, we're developing a mouse line with that same uh, gene reporter, um, and if we can do that in the mouse, obviously that would be key. And, and you don't think if you forced expression of axon 2 in that other population of cells, so from, from a cell therapy standpoint, it could sure. enhance regeneration? So we haven't tried that yet. So when we have turned on axon 2, beta catenin axon 3 uh, line in all SPC type cells, um, we do see an increased number of axon 2 positive cells, but it's not like, you know, you go from 20 percent to like 80 percent. You see like 20 to 30 percent. So there is a resistance of the normal AT2 population to acquire the state at least is what, how we would interpret that. Great, thanks. All right. Okay. So, if there are no more questions, we move to the next speaker, Dr. Davis.
from the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. The title of uh, his talk is Gene Editing on stem of Stem Cells from Cystic Fibrosis Patients. Thank you. I'm really grateful for the chance today to present uh, work not only from that of my laboratory, but also uh, this represents really a very close collaboration over the last several years uh, with at least three other groups. One of those is Daryl Cotton's group and Finn Hawkins from Boston University Medical Center, um, who really have uh, helped us with the developmental biology of the lung. Um, the second group is that of Sangamo Therapeutics, uh, who due to their expertise in zinc finger nuclease Immediate genome editing have really uh, helped us with um, the kind of, of editing that I'm going to describe today. And finally, Eric Sorcher's lab, first at University of Alabama, Birmingham, and then um, at uh, Emory University, who's helped us with the functional characterization of CFTR uh, repair. So what I'd like to do today is to uh, really uh, focus on cystic fibrosis. And uh, essentially, this is a, a recessive disease. Uh, that can result from, uh, it's been cataloged now almost up to 2,000 different mutations uh, in a particular gene called CFTR. And uh, the most common of those mutations affecting probably um, 70 to 90 percent of, of Caucasians with the disease is this delta F508, which is a deletion of exactly three nucleotides in exon 11 that I'll focus on in just a moment. A CFTR is a protein, is a, a channel and an anion channel expressed um, in epithelial cells. I'm going to focus today on the airway, uh, but it also plays important roles in terms of function or dysfunction of the intestine, pancreas, uh, and reproductive tract of affected individuals. And essentially, by uh, disrupting CFTR activity, you end up with uh, um, dysfunction in the, the channel activity and therefore leading to inadequate hydration of the uh, surface epithelium, and this builds up essentially mucus aggregates and, and drying and really serves as a source for uh, an environment in which bacteria and different uh, microorganisms can, um, can profit. So uh, essentially, there's been, fortunately, over the last several years, some really important breakthroughs in terms of developing drugs that are able to um, uh, restore CFTR activity uh, involving specific mutations now, but I think we're going to see sort of a panoply of, of mutations that can benefit from these drugs. But essentially, the approach I'm going to talk today is essentially for a, a final uh, cure or therapy, which would be done at the level of either a gene or cell therapy. So if we think about gene editing approaches, essentially, uh, one can think about either a sort of the, the methodology that's been pursued mainly in the hematopoietic system for a random delivery via retroviruses or lentiviruses of a cDNA uh, that is then under the control of some promoter. Uh, this has certain uh, advantages in terms of efficiency of, of delivery, uh, but there can be issues in terms of both regulation of expression of the delivered transgene as well as issues of potential leukemogenesis. Um, in the case of a safe harbor or site-specific correction or target endogenous integration, these are methodologies that are essentially facilitated by either uh, introduction of a sequence-specific double-stranded break through zinc finger nucleases, talons, CRISPRs, um, meganucleases, for example, although in the next talk we'll hear about the ability to accomplish some of the same uh, gene editing, specifically for site-specific correction uh, without the use of, of nucleases. So our focus mainly has been on these last two approaches, that is of site-specific correction, where let's say you have a mutation, for example here, uh, the delta F508 mutation in exon 11, that you essentially, um, in a site-specific way, uh, restore essentially the, the correct uh, DNA sequence here without affecting the rest of the locus. The benefit here is you still benefit from the normal transcriptional machinery and the uh, endogenous um, chromatin environment to hopefully uh, maintain the appropriate expression. I'm also going to talk about target endogenous integration, which is a methodology that has the benefit that if you're able to target one of the upstream uh, introns here and by restoring essentially this corrective uh, mini-gene has the potential then of, of, of irrespective of 
with a downstream mutation that may occur is essentially one, one um, uh, approach that can in fact uh, potentially treat a variety of mutations. So essentially I'm going to talk about two types of, of CF uh, stem cells today. The first is going to be that of uh, induced pluripotent stem cells uh, derived from CF individuals and then in the second half of the talk I'll talk about uh, targeting of autologous airway basal cells. And the idea of this approach is essentially um, that uh, in the case of, let's say, uh, fibroblasts or blood cells derived from a CF patient is to uh, using the Yamanaka reprogramming methodology to derive the mutant iPS cells. One can then differentiate those for purposes of disease modeling or for uh, drug testing, drug screening, or one can do gene editing to get the corrected cells and either essentially derive the mature cells to demonstrate functional correction or um, in the third, second half of the talk, I'll talk a lot of, about sort of deriving the stem cells that can be used for therapeutic uh, transplantation. So essentially, the initial uh, report um, uh, that we did in 2015 really focused on uh, a fibroblast derived from two different uh, genotypes. Uh, in this case, it was a compound heterozygous. Um, fibroblast line obtained from Coriel repository, where when we looked carefully at exon 11, it turns out this was in fact compound heterozygote, where we had both the delta I507 uh, mutation on one of the alleles and the delta F508 on the other allele. We essentially made iPS cells from these and then used the following sort of gene editing strategy. That is, this is showing either the delta I507 or delta F508 mutation, and we have zinc finger nucleases targeted toward the upstream region of um, exon 11, introduced a double-stranded break, and then delivered a, a donor molecule which incl included essentially replacement wild-type exon 11 except for uh, a, a silent mutation that we could use for identifying the corrected clones. And then also in this case, uh, since we're able to use iPS cells that can be uh, selected with drug and maintained for long periods of time, uh, passages without loss of differentiation, we used a pure OTK marker that allowed us to select. We then did the, uh, essentially the molecular characterization to identify those clones that were corrected. And then we did cremiate excision to essentially leave a lock site in place, and we successfully use this methodology uh, in the compound heterozygous line that I just talked about, where we corrected either the delta I five hundred seven to wild type or the delta F five hundred eight to wild type, and we also used homozygous um, delta F five hundred eight lines and showed that we were able to correct those as well. So, what's uh, one of the advantages of working with the iPS cells is that because one is able to essentially expand them and have clonal um, populations. We were able to do extensive uh, characterization of the cells after the correction, looking at karyotype, comparative genomic hybridization, whole exome sequencing, so in an unbiased way we could de determine whether we had, through either the zinc finger nucleases or through some manipulation, introduced any changes, or we then did um, uh, with, with Sangamo Therapeutics, essentially the bioinformatic prediction of off-target sites, and we did whole genome sequencing on two of the corrected lines and showed that at none of the predicted off-target sites did we see any evidence of non-homologous end joining um, that would be the result of off-target uh, zinc finger nuclease activity. So essentially, uh, uh, Ed did a beautiful job of sort of describing how you start um, in the developmental process and eventually uh, from uh, very primitive immature cells are able to sort of drive uh, uh, in vivo the development of the lung and essentially what the goal of a number of laboratories has been is starting with human iPS or human ES cells is to essentially try to recapitulate this developmental process um, in, the, in, the, in the petri dish so that we can in fact end up with um, lung cells. And essentially what uh, we did together with Daryl Cotton's group was to sort of work on optimizing uh, a methodology where we first uh, induced definitive endoderm, uh, we're then able to anteriorize, then ventralize, and end up with a population of cells after days uh, 15 through 21 or so that essentially begin to acquire um, lung markers. Now these cells are not pure lung cells, I'll get back into that. 
um, uh, in just a moment. But we see now activation. This is just taking either uh, human ES cells here or taking the mutant IPS cells or corrected lines here and looking at them at 19 to 21 days. And we see upregulation of CFTR. We see NKX 2.1, the transcription factor that Ed mentioned as being associated with, um, with lung uh, uh, differentiation. Uh, we have TP63 that I'll come back to in a moment. We see down regulation of all the pluripotency genes. And when we took these cells here and then analyzed them by Western blot, um, we were able to see restoration of the fully glycosylated CFTR protein. And just shown over here is that if you take delta F508 and you express it, um, that you end up not with the fully glycosylated uh, band C here. It's only with the wild type that you see the fully functional protein that's able to uh, go to the cell surface. And shown over here is that in the case of the mutant 17, when differentiated, that we fail to see the, uh, the band C here. Um, this is now with the corrected line here compared with uh, human ES-derived um, epithelium. And in this case, you see the band C and just showing treatment with glycosylase reduces you down to core here. So we saw a restoration in these differentiated cultures of CFTR protein, and importantly then, when these cells were placed on a semi-permeable membrane and then um, analyzed for uh, anion channel activity, uh, what you can see here is that the original 17, this is the mutant line, compound heterozygous delta I5, 507 delta 5. You see no activity. When you treat it with a particular CF drug, the X89, you see some restoration of activity but then the 1716C1 is now a line that's corrected at one allele. And, and because it's a recessive disease, essentially uh, correcting just one of the um, alleles is sufficient to restore CFTR activity. So the issue now is how do we utilize these uh, corrected cells um, for purposes of uh, eventual therapeutics? And uh, that's sort of highlighted here by what types of stem cells can we think about for a therapeutic application. And in this case here, this is a, a diagram on uh, this side right here showing the, the human lung. And essentially in the uh, airways here, that as Ed mentioned, we essentially have the pseudostratified um, epithelium where you have these basal cells here that then, um, and, and also the ciliated and the secretory cells. And essentially the, the basal cells have the capability of not only uh, giving rise to the ciliated and secretory cells, but they have the capacity for a self-renewal as well. So the idea was then the, the basal cells being a multipotent stem cell population of the airway epithelium, uh, depending upon where you are in the airway, uh, there are approximately 6 to 30 percent of the cells in the epithelium that are in fact the basal cells. And at least a hypothesis is that uh, since the cells are long-lived, a self-renewing population, that if we're able to actually accomplish correction in basal cells, they could potentially provide a long-term remedy. So the, the idea is then if we have our corrected IPS cells over here on the left, uh, can we in fact um, uh, obtain a, a differentiation uh, methodology that at the end is able to give rise to specifically airway cells, and for that purpose, we're going to use NKX 2.1 as a marker. One can also generate NKX 2.1 thyroid cells or, or uh, forebrain cells, but using the methodology that we're using here, uh, we're able to um, highly specify for the lung. So these are the primordial lung progenitors. Then the idea is to be able to uh, get essentially airway cells or uh, proximal as opposed to distal, then we want to see essentially the appearance of a SOX2 transcription factor. And then finally, to be able to generate the basal cells, basal cells in the airway are marked by several markers, including P63, keratin-5, keratin-14. So the idea is to see whether we can in fact derive this population of cells um, in vitro. And what we first did is sort of using gene editing of these same IPS cells, either CF17 or a wild-type IPS line or a human um, embryonic stem cells, was essentially to essentially do a knock-in of GFP into the endogenous NKX 2.1 locus 
but to do it in such a way that we were able to um, not induce haploinsufficiency. That is, we retain essentially through the splice acceptor exon 3, even from the target allele, we still retain expression of NKX 2.1. And uh, we just published uh, last uh, week together with Daryl Cotton's group, essentially in JCI, essentially the use of this particular reporter to uh, obtain um, uh, lung progenitors. And this is just shown an example here where one can start with, let's say, day 15, these primordial lung progenitors, and then either take them in an unsorted way or sort out the GFP positive cells and end up with lung organoids or bronchospheres um, by sorting on this NKX 2.1 positive cells. And in this uh, diagram here, it just shows that by using that uh, GFP reporter, one is able at day 19, and this is over a 24-hour period, is one is able to see the emergence of, of essentially lung-specific cells um, in these organoids. And importantly, when we then look at the transcription, uh, transcriptome analysis of these bulk purified uh, GFP positive cells that are NKX 2.1, what we see is that we then take those out to, let's say, day 28. What we can see is essentially a population of cells that is, uh, has some expression of SOX2, the proximal marker, has expression of uh, P63, the basal cell marker, NKX 2.1, and also has um, some level of CFTR. And what uh, um, Daryl Cotton's group was able to report just a couple of months ago in cell stem cell was that essentially at this day 15 time point by withdrawing WINT they're able to essentially drive a program which is normally skewed toward the distal but in fact are able to then specifically drive toward the proximal where the majority of the NKX 2.1 cells now acquire expression of SOX2, and they can be put into alley cultures and demonstrate generation of, of uh, a well-differentiated ep epithelium. Uh, but we wanted to sort of move beyond simply the proximal cells to the uh, basal cells, and for that purpose, we took the same lines in which we had introduced this NKX 2.1 GFP, and again, using gene editing. I think in this case, we used either Talons or CRISPR-Cas9 in making this P63 um, a fluorescent reporter, we used CRISPR-Cas9 to introduce this DT tomato, and we did in such a way that it captures all of the essentially transcripts coming either of the TAP63 promoter or the Delta NP63 promoter and are able to um, read out the DT tomato. And we're still in an early stage now of, of characterizing this, but importantly, um, we're now able to generate uh, by putting these cells after the proximalization protocol and then maintaining them in either organoids or, or then uh, putting them into um, uh, alley culture, we're able to generate uh, different types of cells that are NKX 2.1 positive, P63 positive, and just shown here is we have cells co-staining, these are organoids co-staining for both NKX 2.1 and P63. So the hope is, is that by using one of these, um, uh, and we're still at an early stage, but the idea is that once one has a, um, a methodology developed that can give rise to, uh, with high efficiency and, and reproducibility to um, essentially proximal basal cells that one may be able to be able to use this in some kind of transplant setting. Obviously, the use of the reporters would not be done for therapeutic purposes. Essentially, we're using these to identify surface markers that equally can be used to sort out uh, the lung-specific um, and then the, the basal cells. And in fact, in our paper in JCI, we reported that use of, of CD47 is a surface marker that uh, gives rise to, with high efficiency, to um, co-purification of the NKX 2.1 positive cells. So I focused thus far on autologous iPSCs, but it turns out that I'd like to focus just briefly on the idea of autologous airway basal cells. It turns out that there has been um, quite a bit of, of significant advances in the last five years where people have used uh, a couple of, one of two methodologies for essentially starting with, let's say, explanted lungs or epithelial, um, lung epithelial cells is to essentially expand and um, a relatively pure population of basal cells uh, in vitro, uh, either in this case by putting them, this is sort of the 
a modification of the original Howard Green protocol for keratinocytes, but essentially putting them on an irradiated fibroblast feeder cell and using ROC inhibitor. One can essentially expand these cells um, for at least uh, a number uh, of passages, or recently published by uh, Hong Mei Mao and uh, Jay Ragapal, a methodology that doesn't require um, the, the fibroblasts, uh, but uses dual somat inhibition. We've, in fact, used both of these for expanding um, CF or normal uh, airway basal cells. And this just shows here just an example of um, essentially 3T3 fibroblasts that are sort of being pushed away by these developing colonies of, of, of basal cells. And what you can just see in this next slide here is that by staining with P63 is that these cells are um, at least characterized by, by that. We also looked at CD49F and truncated nerve growth factor receptor um, are able to characterize the basal cells as well. So this represents another potential source of autologous patient cells that can be corrected, um, edited in some way, and uh, potentially one day delivered back to patients that we can create the, the, the right environment in the lung. So if we think about how to, in fact, edit these cells, um, there are two methodologies that we've been pursuing together with Sangamo Biosciences. I'm just going up here to Delta F508 again is showing the, the mutant. But the first methodology here is essentially using this half gene or mini gene knock-in approach where one introduces in an intron. Uh, and the idea of using an intron is that even if one has um, alleles that are targeted by the nucleases, uh, that do not get corrected through homology-directed repair, that at least you're, you're just in an intron as, as other, uh, rather than disrupting exonic sequences. And targeting essentially a splice acceptor together with uh, the cDNA, a polydenylation site, and then putting in flanking homology sequences. And we've been using typically 250 base pairs on either end. And again, the idea is to um, uh, benefit from the endogenous uh, transcriptional environment of the CFTR gene. Uh, in my laboratory, in two hematopoietic diseases, we've now uh, shown that this works. For instance, in the Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, we were able to show that the introduction of a, of a half gene like this was expressed appropriately and gave rise to restoration of function. But we'll have to demonstrate that formally for the CFTR locus as well. The other methodology is, is, is very straightforward, is one introduces a sequence specific. Um, double-stranded break, in this case, specifically at the delta F508 sequence, and introduces, let's say, a 100 base single-stranded DNA molecule, and then uh, obtains um, the site-specific correction. So the methodology that we've used for characterizing particularly the, um, uh, the transgene integration has been the following methodology. Um, and uh, developed at Sangamo, where essentially, let's say one has primers here, one that's within the homology arm and one that's outside the homology arm, that by amplifying this and using MySeq sequencing, <coughs> one can then detect which of the alleles have been completely untouched or unmodified versus those that show evidence of non-homologous end joining and therefore the activity, in this case, of the sequence-specific um, nuclease, the ZFN. If we think about incorporating sort of a larger a transgene, in this case the splice acceptor transgene polydenylation, uh, what they have then done is introduce just downstream of the sequences targeted for um, correction of the CFTR gene, essentially uh, sequences that duplicate this particular primer here and then put in essentially a um, uh, a target integration specific sequence here. So by amplifying this, uh, this would be evidence of homology directed repair that we can then use specifically the sequence here, which is not present in the unmodified or the zinc finger nuclease treated domain to essentially quantify the level of homology directed repair. And the idea is then with one particular um, set of primers, amplification, my seek, one can actually come up with a, uh, an assay for non-homologous end joining, targeted integration, as well as unmodified alleles. And this just shows our initial uh, studies now. This is using um, expanded airway basal cells that came from a homozygous Delta F508 patient. 
These are expanded under this dual SMAD inhibition protocol. And essentially what we're doing is we're delivering uh, into intron 7 uh, messenger RNAs encoding zinc finger nucleases. And then we're using AAV6 delivery for the CFTR cDNA uh, flanked by uh, these homology sequences, 250 base pairs on, on either end. And then this is just showing here that if we essentially treat with just the, the donor alone or with the zinc finger nuclease messenger, in this case, we see almost no modification. Here you see perhaps 23% or so of ZFN mediated non-homologous end joining. And then when we also deliver the AAV6 donor, we now see this is about 12.5% of the alleles that are actually targeted uh, by the CFTR 8 through 27 cDNA. So what I would just say is that we have to look in greater detail. We're now uh, doing sort of biological cloning of these. But in principle, if, uh, if there was one allele being modified per uh, uh, TI cell, this would be as many as 25% of cells in the population that could in fact be corrected at one allele and therefore restored to carrier state. Probably we're gonna see some of the sort of biallelic uh, targeting as well, so it's gonna be a little bit less than 25%. This just shows an example here where we're now targeting uh, intron eight. Um, and again, the same, um, roughly the same kind of behavior where non-homologous, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, NHEJ, NHEJ, and here's your TI. And then finally, we've been doing work with some of the Delta F508 specific zinc finger nucleases, that is, these recognize specifically uh, the mutant allele. And here we're testing essentially a variety of ZFN pairs uh, that we can see over here. And now we're introducing either the forward or the reverse strand um, targeting uh, specifically exon 1100 base a single-stranded molecule, and in this case, I think we're seeing two and a half to three percent of the um, alleles being uh, corrected in this way. So where do we go from here? Um, the first is these are just really our initial experiments uh, utilizing these reagents, and uh, so we wish, we wish to sort of modify the, the timing of the electroporation of the messenger RNA from the ZFNs, the AV6 delivery. Um, as well as the doses is to try to optimize the efficiency. A second thing is that we need to demonstrate there's actually been a restoration of expression and functional correction in the basal cell-derived epithelial culture. And this is just an example here that's showing that when we take these uh, airway basal cells, this is from a homozygous delta 508. They've been expanded in this case uh, five, six, seven passages. We can put them into semi-permeable membranes, uh, apply alley to get well differentiated culture, and you can now see that these uh, cultures do respond to various CFTR specific drugs. Finally, I've not presented any data today on the last issue because we really have not begun any experiments, but both of these first methodologies involve essentially sort of ex vivo correction, ex vivo editing, and then somehow creating a way to uh, sort of prepare the lungs to receive, to take up and, um, uh, and graft uh, the corrected airway basal cells, either IPS derived or um, derived directly from the lung. But one could in principle think about applying these same methodologies for editing directly to the airway basal cells as they exist within the lung. And I'd like to uh, just acknowledge uh, really the top three people in my laboratory who've been working on the, um, the gene editing, differentiation cultures, and uh, um, the uh, reporter lines. I've mentioned our fantastic collaboration with Daryl Cotton, Finn Hawkins at Boston University, Eric Sorcher. Um, uh, colleagues at uh, Sangamo Therapeutics have been outstanding, Mike Holmes, Gary Lee, Anthony Conway, and then also uh, other colleagues who's helped us. So I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Um, maybe I'll get started. One of the experiments that, uh, one of the controls that would be interesting to see in your um, uh, HR template uh, correction, have you tried actually just using the AV and not the nucleases to see what the background level of just homologous recombination is with the, with the adeno-associated virus? Yes, we've in fact, and I think one of those um, uh, 
controls that we, we've had in both experiments. When we deliver AAV alone, the larger donor is that we see um, no target integration of, of that particular contract. Is, is that what you're yep. talking about? Yes, no, we, we don't, we see minimal, if, if any, of that. Uh, yes, very nice talk. How do you envision uh, transplanting these, uh, these corrected cells back into the lung? It's really a, an important question and a significant challenge. Thus far, the work that I've seen for the ability to deliver uh, potential lung stem populations, the lung, sort of consisted of two types, both of which um, I don't believe we'd be able to do in, in humans. The, the first is Susan Reynolds has done some very beautiful work with an enlapsin model where she's actually uh, treated the animals, shown that she's able to create an environment when she delivers either mouse or human airway basal cells that, that they're able to take up and graft and to, to differentiate. Um, uh, then uh, the group of uh, Yari Reiser from, uh, from Israel, uh, hopefully I'm getting the name right, but they used essentially uh, treatment of naphthalene together with irradiation and showed that delivering cells, in that case from a certain state of embryonic development, they were able to deliver through the bloodstream and these cells were able to come up and sort of evidently cross the barrier into the lung and take up residence there. But I think that this is really an area that a lot of work needs to be invested in. I don't think that we're gonna be using the strength of those reagents. I think somehow we have to maybe identify what are the pathways involved in sort of you know, causing cells to maybe um, uh, uh, to be lost from the surface epithelium and create an environment where we can actually deliver those cells into. Real challenge. Are, are you exploring at all the the possibility of actually doing this in vivo as opposed to ex vivo? Yes, one of the reasons why we, um, uh, I'm not sure that AV6 is gonna be the right tool for delivery. There, there are some issues in the lung of how to, uh, John Engelhardt and others have really studied certain barriers towards sort of getting across the, um, the apical side to be able to get into the basal cells if that's what one wants to do. Um, but I think that uh, there may be other ways of either um, a nanoparticles or maybe new vectors that we'll be able to accomplish. But we, we are still, uh, we've not tried that yet. Thank you. Great, thank you.